Hello, everybody. Welcome to the stream. I know I said I was starting at 5.01, but, uh, you know, just a little bonus for you. Show up a minute early. Uh, <laughs> speaking of which, thank you for showing up. I know it's uh, quite a random time for a live stream. Thursday evening, and probably an even more inconvenient time for a lot of you across the globe. So thanks for making it. Brody, it's great to see you. Long time follower. So excited to have you here. And uh, we've also got Sammy T, Gerard, Miles. Thank you all for showing up. You know what? I like a small crowd. It makes it cozy, makes it so I can actually keep my eye on the chat and follow along while doing whatever I'm doing, which you'll find out soon enough. Yeah, we are making something today, hopefully. Before we make something, we're going to take something apart. And uh, that's almost just as fun. <laughs> Anyways, the reason we're doing the stream on a Thursday afternoon is because uh, this Saturday is my birthday. Believe it or not, this young face is turning 32 years old. So I'm going to be uh, up in the mountains where my sister lives, spending some time with the family. I know I've been on vacation with them for like two months, but uh, what can I say? I love them. Can't get enough. So I just wanted to sneak in a little something for y'all this week. And that's why we're here. Yeah, where are y'all coming from? I'd love to hear. We've got Ulysses coming from Argentina. Buenos dias. Is it, is it not the, I don't know what time it is. South Africa, Gerard. Awesome. That's so awesome. Yes, yes. Turning 32 and uh, I hardly believe it myself. Time sure flies, but I think today's live stream will age me a bit because uh, we're working on something that is maybe 15 years old, something I've wanted ever since then. Hello, Luis from Mexico. Little, little one from Louisiana. Tremaine, not far away. You're in San Diego. I'm in Orange County. All right. Let's not dilly-dally too much. I want to uh, reward y'all for showing up on time and get the ball rolling. So, yes, this is the mystery for today's live stream. This is a, a, a toy that kind of went viral on the internet like 15 years ago. And I've wanted it ever since then. And only recently did I finally get it. Let me switch to my other camera. Might as well start trying things out. Let's see how many of you recognize this thing. Does that ring a bell to anyone? My keep on? So this is a, a dancing robot. And uh, yeah, like I said, it, there was a viral video many a year ago. I actually, uh, let's open up the website. I think Beatbox, Beatbox is a company that uh, bought them out or somehow uh, took the rights for this robot. So there was another company beforehand. Let's see, who is this? Who does this one belong to? It's got Japanese on it. Of course it's Japanese. It's such a Japanese toy. Dino, thank you. Uh, I don't have cheese on hand at the moment. If I have to run and grab something from the garage, which there's a good chance I will, I may eat cheese on your behalf for old time's sake. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, see, I'm old. Like no one knows what this thing is. But uh, yeah, I mean, look at this. 10 years ago, the Harlem Shake. The Harlem Shake was 10 years ago? Are you kidding me? It's crazy. Anyways, here's the video that uh, turned me onto this toy. This one is at least 16 years old. Holy cow. And I have it muted because during my test stream, YouTube immediately shut down the stream once it started playing music. So I really have to hope that the neighbors don't start blasting Taylor Swift or something. But look at this thing. This is a little toy. You play music and it automatically starts dancing to the beat. And it grooves. Look at that. It's grooving so hard. 
I'd be lying if I said that this little robot didn't influence my dance moves for the better part of my life. I learned a lot from this little guy, this one video, and they also turned me on to Spoon. I, I knew of the band before, but I didn't really listen to it much. Still love this song, which I'm not playing, but you know. You can imagine, it's dancing to the beat. Oh, Brody, you haven't seen it either? Okay. But look at that. Look at that groove. Anyways. Uh, it seems like this thing is discontinued. So, to this day, there's a few available on eBay. But they were like 80 bucks, and as much as I wanted one, I'm still frugal. So, I wasn't quite willing to drop 80 on it. But, I found this one. Which, uh, apparently is slightly malfunctioning. And I found it for, I think I haggled it down to 25 bucks shipped. So I was like, okay, I'm willing to spend 25 And if it's a little bit broken, that's okay, because I run a making channel, so we can make a live stream out of it. <laughs> and I actually uh, went onto my eBay and tried to find the messages I had with this guy beforehand. Um, but apparently I bought this over three years ago. And eBay doesn't keep a record that far back. That's how long I've been waiting to do this live stream. These live streams, they always uh, give me a little bit of heebie-jeebies. I'm not, not too comfortable being on the spot like this, but I think we're doing all right so far. Anyways, that's the dancing robot. And uh, let's go ahead and open this up. Yeah, like I was saying, I'm pretty sure uh, the messaging with this guy, he said that it's just like one motor or something. It dances, but it doesn't dance quite right. So, we'll have to see whether it's a mechanical issue or an electronic issue. But uh, part of the reason I wanted to do this live is because I'm pretty bad with electronics. So, all of your help is going to help me out. Whatever advice you can give me. So, let's go ahead and open this guy up. Oh! It's squishy in a weird way. It's like a, that kind of rubber that feels a little wet. It feels kind of moist, but it it actually is a little bit sticky. So maybe the maybe the rubber is starting to degrade, but it still seems like it'll hold up. And I was actually thinking, if this whole thing just happened to disintegrate, it'd be a pretty awesome use of a springo to re replicate this guy as a springo, and I think it would still work. I actually reached out to this company, or the company that bought them out. Uh, let me show you. On their website, which also hasn't had any updates or anything for at least 10 years, but it says that it was co-developed with WoW Stuff, which is this company, and it's a hackable toy version of the popular Keep On Robot. So I think this one I have is the original, not the so-called hackable version. So hopefully I can still... Uh, fix this up, but also I couldn't find anything on this updated version. I was hoping it would be open source or something, and I reached out to the company asking if they wanted to partner up and make it open source, and then I could make a Springo version of it, but I didn't hear back from them. They're just completely uh, vanished at this point. I mean, the website's still up, but couldn't make any contact, so this is my first attempt at getting one of these robots working. Let's see how it goes. Yes, this is uh, from the original company, WoW Stuff. Oh no, actually, sorry, this camera. It says WoW plus BeatBots. So this might be the so-called hackable version, which could be a saving grace. Might, might bring up my hopes for actually being able to uh, get this thing running again. I mean, fingers crossed, it might already run, and then who knows what we'll do. I actually do have some backup projects for today because I know this might just be dead on arrival or something. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, start by opening up the battery port, the things that are meant to be opened up. I'm sorry, I can't get my camera to have a better depth of field here. So I'm going to be adjusting it a lot, I guess. Making sure I'm in focus. Ah, the depth of field looks artsy, right? And there's some uh, dirt and dust coming off of this thing. Classic.
Alrighty. So this thing uses eight AA batteries. So if it does happen to just be working perfectly, another uh, another way we can approach it today is just uh, converting it into uh, an outlet powered thing. I'd like to just plug this in. Or uh, I'm pretty sure eight uh, AA batteries equals 12 volts. This is my first uh, uh, ask the audience right here, because like I said, I'm terrible at, ele at electronics, but I know that uh, the uh, cigarette outlet on a car, that outputs 12 volts, right? So I should be able to connect that to here, and it should work just fine, right? I always forget how uh, the amperage affects things. But if I recall, as long as there's enough amperage, it should work, right? Dino spiders? Dino? Dino or Dino? Uh, I actually do have my camera set to the uh, 22 f-stop, but I think it's the... I'm using the preview to stream, and I think for the preview it, it just defaults to whatever gives it good lighting. I don't know. And if I make it brighter in this room, then I, I turn into a ghost. So, anyways, this seems to be working. I just have to remember to stay within the focus range here. All right. Oh, I guess I should have tried turning it on. Who knows, maybe these batteries work. All right, super exciting, huh? Plugging in batteries. All right, I am gonna do it, because eight AA batteries, that ain't that cheap. I already dropped 25 on this thing. Let's see what happens if I just use these batteries. It is, uh, Bit of a Hail Mary, but I don't know. Worth a shot, worth a shot. Let's flip it on. I also haven't read any instructions. Oh my gosh! Wait, there's already a port to like plug this in, so if I get the right adapter, I don't need to do anything too crazy to plug it in. reacting to me or if it's just doing its thing right now. Alright, hey little guy. How cute is that? <laughs> cute or annoying? I think it's waiting for music. I pressed the music note. Let me press that again. Oh my gosh. Now it's doing everything twice. There's another button here. I don't know what's happening right now. Is this the glitch? The second button is doing nothing. <laughs> oh my gosh. This must be... It's, it must be glitching out right now. But I also don't know this thing so well. I don't even know how to turn it off. <laughs> God. It squeaked! <laughs> Chill, bro! gonna turn it off for now. <laughs> I should have watched the instruction videos, I would have known what's normal behavior and what is not. Um, something super cool about this robot, I'm pretty sure these are uh, cameras built into the eyes, a little microphone in the nose. So it's supposed to follow me around maybe. Oh you're right, there is a manual. That's always really exciting, reading a manual on a live stream but probably wise as well. Whoops. Did I lose y'all? My screen is falling asleep. Okay, yeah, it's a simple manual, so uh, it won't be too bad. To get started, set the power switch to on. Keep on will wake up and begin a startup sequence, which lasts around five seconds. I have a feeling it's just running the startup sequence over and over again then. The two yellow mode buttons allow you to switch between touch and dance modes. You can switch between them at any time. Do not press either of the buttons. Oh, if you do not press either of the buttons, it will enter touch mode. In touch mode, 
Keep on is sensitive to being poked, patted, tickled, squeezed. Isn't this thing awesome? A little background, this was actually uh, designed as a toy to soothe uh, people with autism. So I don't know what that says about my intense attraction to it, but it seems like it could be soothing if it doesn't get to this, if it gets past this stage of just spazzing out. Let's try turning it on again and not pressing any of the buttons. He does look cheesy, doesn't he? Okay, so five second startup sequence is what we should get. See, I think that's it restarting. Or maybe one of the buttons is like permanently touched inside there. We're definitely gonna have to open this thing up. In dance mode, it listens for rhythm. You can put it into sleep mode by pressing both buttons at the same time. Let's try that. <laughs> this guy does not want to sleep. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, it's basically as promised by the uh, seller. It's it moves, so we don't have any like huge broken bits inside, but uh, it's passing out. It might just be battery acid, or I don't know. Let's find out. Let's find out. I guess I'll start by popping out the batteries. We'll take off the shell, then we'll plug the batteries back in and see what happens. Oh, we gotta name him. That's a good point. How do we, uh, how do we come up with a name for this guy? Uh, it might have to do something with... It's like a wild horse, you know? I feel like this is a special keep on doesn't just come out of the box and work. You have to tame this guy. Okay, there's four screws here. Let's open it up. Like I said, this is apparently the hackable version, so it should be uh, fairly forgiving when it comes to opening it up and working on it. He could use a little scrub down too. There's a little bit of gunk on him, but let's see. let's see if we can make progress on the electronics first. Yeah, I honestly did not expect this to be such a noisy toy. I thought it just listens. I didn't think it actually makes noise. But I guess that's probably like a key feature for any children's toy. Kids don't like it if it doesn't make noise. I feel like there should be a market for uh, Toys with ultrasonic speakers, you know, directional sound, so that only the kid can hear it and the parents don't have to deal with it. Because there's a real, uh, there's a real disparity between what kids want and what adults want when it comes to the, the noise of their toys. Yeah, we could disconnect the speaker, but uh, first I just want to get it working properly before we really start hacking it. I know there's that uh, Adam Savage tested video recently where he quieted down some toys. Okay. It opens. Let's uh, up the light in here a bit. All right. So there we can see the switches. Can y'all see that? Switches. I'm gonna try not to be fiddling around with the camera too much, but I guess you want to see what's going on in here. We've got buttons, button, speaker. Very simple so far. This is the kind of electronics I like. Just analog stuff. And um, here we've got the actual robot. This is actually quite interesting, because uh, I've always wondered how they get this robot to dance in such a smooth and, uh, frankly, not so robotic fashion. It's a very groovy movement that this robot has. Uh, I'm not sure this pops out as easily. There's a... There's a circuit board in there, and it's covered with a little, like, uh, what's it called? Vacuum-formed plastic shield. 
It's got some protection on it. Everything in the hair looks quite good. It's not like looking rusty or anything. There's a dial here. Oop. Maybe some kind of potentiometer. It's got arrows and looks like it's made to be adjusted. So I wonder if that is for adjusting the sensitivity of the sound or something. Uh, again, if this is made to be hackable, there might be a manual online that talks about actually messing around inside of here. Boy with skills, you want to know what I'm up to? I've always got some big projects in the works, but uh, I also always want to keep it a secret, so I'm not going not gonna to give that away just yet, but uh, I have some interesting stuff coming up. Some random stuff as always, and some... Uh, home fixes and a ton of things I've already done that could become a cool prints video. And of course, every time I come up with a video full of puzzles, while I'm making that video, I have a bunch of new puzzle ideas, but I don't want to get so stuck in the puzzle side of things, but it happens. I can't help it. So I've got some really cool puzzles that I also want to make. Anyways, so there's a DC motor in here. There's another one here. Two regular old motors, no servos that I can see yet. Some very interesting uh, engineering. This whole frame part is geared, so I guess that might be how the whole thing rotates. I guess this could be a good time to put the batteries back in and see what it's doing at this point. Unless I can remove this com Oh, there we go. I'd really like to get him out of the frame without breaking it. Seems to budge. There are some, a lot of things plugged into the actual outer base on the bottom. But I can't see what's holding it in place right now, what's keeping it from coming out further. Oh, it's moving more and more, little by little. Come on, let's not break anything. There's a broken plastic tab there. At least one thing is broken, but it doesn't look critical. Oh. Hmm. Maybe I don't want to remove it just like this. I'm seeing there's a... Uh, maybe like an, ax an axle, a driver, I don't know, something coming from the bottom up into the center of this, like maybe that's a motor that's driving it. But no, this looks like it's meant to be taken out. I mean, it had to be constructed. That's what I always have to tell myself. This was assembled, so there is a way to disassemble it. You just gotta do it in the right order. But yeah, there's a chip that's on the base, and there's also chips that are stuck on this moving part. I guess we'll start by unplugging uh, this little deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could unplug the speakers and everything, and the buttons. Then we have to remember what goes where. Let me take a photo. Anyone who takes stuff apart knows that uh, it's always good practice to take a lot of photos anytime you're going to unplug anything and you think, oh, I'll remember where that screw went. Then 20 parts later, you're completely in the dark and that thing is going in the trash. I'm going to take a picture of these plugs here. Thankfully, all the cables are nice and brightly colored. Let me grab some tweezers here. I honestly feel quite out of my wheelhouse when I'm doing this kind of stuff. I mean, I've been taking apart toys my whole life, but I never feel like I know what I'm doing. And I know there's a lot of smart people in there who are probably like, no, don't unplug it with tweezers or something like that. But no, the tweezers are working great. No regrets. One, two. 
three. All right. It's officially started dismantling. So there's another big plug back there. Ah, all right, I think this is our next step. We've got two screws right here on the bottom. I believe that will allow us to remove everything. I guess the problem is uh, if I take too much apart before diagnosing what's wrong with it, we won't really be able to figure out what's wrong with it, right? But anyways, a little visual inspection might not be such a bad idea. And already these screws are different from the ones on the outside. And already I'm missing a screw. I'm missing one of the screws from the outside part. See, I'm all talk. This is how you should do things, and then I don't do it. Oh, it's still it's still in there. The screw is not lost. But what I will do is uh, place the screws on a piece of paper and then draw circles around it and write what it belonged to. Then at least if I don't move the paper, I'll we'll know where things belong. An even smarter way to do it would be to have like a sheet of styrofoam and then you can press the screws into the styrofoam so they don't fall around. All right. So those screws are out and out falls this thing. Can anyone identify what the heck this is? Just looks like a... Oh, another potentiometer of sorts, maybe? There's nothing on the bottom. Looks like it's not connected to anything. Ah. Okay, okay, this is very interesting. Uh, so, it's hard to show, but there are two pins here. They're spring-loaded pins. There's two spring-loaded pins that go against this. And a, so maybe that's just to help it orient itself. You can tell which way it's facing best, based on... Uh, whether it's closing the circuit between those two pins, something like that. It can always uh, get itself facing forward again. I don't know. One thing that's interesting with the uh, children's toys like this is they have to be designed to withstand some abuse. So there's all, often systems inside that like, yeah, maybe the kid is going to manually twist it. Something like that. Anyways, that's interesting. Uh, so if there's things like this, could just be uh, could just be that uh, the pads for the startup sequence. Maybe it was trying to make contact with this, and since it's a little worn down, maybe it's not closing the circuit. So maybe I just have to clean this with ISO, and it'll work again. There's a chance. Let's go a little bit further before we try that out. Alrighty. I would still like to get this whole thing out. Even if it's not necessary, I think it would be educational to take this apart and get a better understanding of how it works. But I still don't know what what's in the way right now. I'm not seeing any screws or tight cables that are keeping it from coming out further. Um, 
You know what? I am going to test out my theory with this. Because I've had a lot of things that uh, fail just because the contact is lost between two parts. So, uh, never mind. I was going to just put the batteries in and manually close the circuit between those two pins, but the batteries go in front of the pins, so I won't be able to reach them. I could... I don't know, I could... stick a piece of foil on there. I don't have any foil tape easily accessible. Ah, okay, let me keep fidgeting this and seeing if I can get it to come apart. Where is it being held in place? It seems to be the battery... Or that, that like, uh, the plastic bit that's covering the circuit board is hitting some of the, uh, some parts of the battery compartment on the bottom. So, how do I move one of those things? There's screw, there's a screw that I can access for the battery compartment, but only the one. Oh! Hold up! This whole thing... It's just friction! It was just friction. This doesn't even have any moving parts on it. Wow. I mean, I shouldn't feel too bad. You want to be a, a bit careful with stuff like this. You know, I don't want any unnecessary damage. But sometimes all it takes is a little bit of, uh, a little bit of gusto to get it to come apart. Hey, Turtle Cuber. Uh, Currently not making. We're taking apart this robot. Things are starting to fall apart, which is good. At this point, I can test my theory. There's actually three springs that would make contact with this disc. It's curious. It's curious. Let me see, what do I have that I can use to close the contact between those? I've got solder. Duh. Yeah. Just gonna use some standard solder. Not solder it on, but just like press the solder against the pins and see if anything happens when I uh, close circuits. Although it might be that all three have to close at the same time. Anyways, let's put some batteries in now that this is a little bit apart. Let's make sure nothing's gonna... These gear wheels now can disengage. Which shouldn't be so bad. I think, I think it's safe to plug this in. Oh, I did miss a comment. Someone mentioned, ah, uh, yeah. Tight, tight gen, tight gen, tight gen engineering. The arrangement of the batteries might, uh, or would determine whether this is 12 volts or, uh, you know, or just 1.5, if it's in series or in parallel. I forget what does what. <laughs> It's really basics, but uh, what can I say? It goes above my head every time. All right. So let's get this in focus for the big moment. Something exciting could happen, good or bad. Let's turn it on. The speaker is unplugged now, so that's good. <laughs> it's no longer bound by its stand, though. It might just run off the desk. Oh, look at that. It's actually less spastic. Or is it just because it's not noisy that it seems like it's doing less? I gotta say, I quite like this quiet version of the robot. So while it's spazzing out, oh gosh, let's try to close some of these circuits. Let's 
So that was two. That did nothing. Here's a different two. I think it's behaving differently. Oh man, it's hard to tell. Now the final pair of two. Did it seem to you like it changed what it was doing? I, it kind of seemed like the, the behavior was changing depending on which of the two circuits I closed. But maybe I have to close all three. I don't know. Hard to tell, hard to tell. Let's turn this off for a second. My hands are getting covered in grease. <laughs> All right, LC Jean says most house wiring is in parallel, so I'm guessing parallel is for relatively cons constant voltage. Um, I mean, can you look at this and tell me? <laughs> tell me what's happening here? Uh, first of, well, oh yeah, it's got half red and half black, even though these are all the, uh, positive terminals of the batteries. So maybe it is, um... Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> Hard to see exactly where that's going. A lot of hot glue. Proper engineering right there. Yeah, I can't say uh can't say that I can figure it out exactly. That's where the speakers and stuff went in right here. But it looks like the batteries are going into three different ports here. But there's also another connection with two wires here. That's no, that's the power switch. The power switch is two wires. They're going into there somewhere. Oh, and Springify. I was talking about that earlier. That was kind of uh, my go-to plan. If this thing doesn't work, it would it would totally work well as a Springo. So I might do that either way if I get this thing working. Anyways, all right. I need to I need to close all three circuits and see if that will do something. So I'm going to make a triangle here. How do I do this? Uh you might be able to get a better view now of the pins. See right there, there, and there. Three springy pins that used to go against this. I'm gonna see if I can close it with a piece of solder. It's kinda of awkward to do that though. Multimeter? Oh. That's another one of those things that I just don't trust myself using. I'm going to poke something on accident, short circuit it, I'm going to hit a capacitor and it'll blow up. All right, Brody, thanks for showing up. Go on, get rest, or we'll get the morning started. Still trying to figure out what time it is for you. Oh. Okay. This looks like it will do it. I think this shape will be able to touch all three pins at once. Let's give it a shot. I'm touching all three. Oh. So 
So I spun around a few times when it was touching all three, and then I switched to just touching two, randomly, and it definitely chilled out. Seemed like it was being chill. So I think, uh, I think that's progress. We might just have to clean this. Sometimes it's the simplest solution. Um, so that means I gotta run and get some ISO alcohol. I'll grab a slice of cheese while I'm at it. For, uh, I think it was Diego that left the super chat. Who was it? Dino, not Diego. Dino spiders. Part of the cheese army. Wanted me to eat cheese. I honestly don't know if that's just an inside thing that became a part of my streams or if that happens across the internet. Is that like a, a thing for all streamers? You got, got to convince them to eat cheese? I don't know, but two bucks super chat and I'm eating cheese. I'm going to grab some iso alcohol, some q-tips. I guess I'll grab the multimeter while I'm at it. Uh, yes, the batteries are all facing the same direction. So what does that mean? There is wiring on both sides. And man, is it a mess of hot, hot glue on that one side. This side's clean. It's got four red, four black on this side. And on the opposite side, I can't really tell. It looks like they might be connected to each other. But they're definitely all, all facing the same direction. All positives on this side. I'm going to run and grab some stuff. In the meantime, please come to a consensus on uh, <laughs> what the voltage is on this thing. I'm sure it's in the manual somewhere too, right? I would actually... Ah. It's not as fun, but there's definitely a thing right here that says input 100 to 120, output 12 volts, 1.5 amps. There you go. Sorry to ruin the fun. That's the answer. <laughs> All right, I'm going to grab those stuff and be right back. Hopefully get this running quickly. All right, I'm back. I got the stuff. Rubbing alcohol. Q-tips, multimeter.
and cheese. String cheese, which I probably haven't had for a decade. Aging myself again. I'm pretty sure this was breakthrough technology when I was in elementary school. And I'm stealing this from my little niece. So, uh, dino spiders, I hope you're happy. Um, whoops. I could use the snack right now, honestly, so, uh, let's hang out for a little bit. What's going on in the chat, y'all? Nothing like electronic grease on mozzarella, am I right? They still haven't gotten past the problem where, uh, it's hard to get a solid string off of this thing. It always starts fat, and then strings off. String cheese technology could use some advances, I gotta say. Um, so yes, that plug is the optional AC adapter. And it is 12 volts, which I think makes it fairly obvious that the batteries are connected in parallel. Is that parallel where they, uh, the voltages add up? No. Yes. Gosh, please tell me. I need to know this stuff. <sighs> a dancing or walking springo could be done with a single motor and no electronics. Single motor sounds like it could be up my wheelhouse. Um, Brody, who was in here a little bit earlier, but had to dip, he recently shared a pretty cool uh, science paper in the Discord chat, which, uh, you know, if you're not in there, get in the Discord. Um, but yeah, it was a video of uh, some scientists who basically evolved the uh, Sphericon in some ways. They made a shape that can roll and follow any path. There's some algorithm that just shapes a ball and just kind of mushes it around until it'll follow exactly the path that you want it to. Super crazy, weird thing. Just goes to show that there is an endless amount of things to be invented. What that'll be used for, I have no idea, but... Sorry. I know you want the full screen view of me eating cheese here. Ah. Oh, so it is series. Not parallel. Well, I was wrong, but now I know. For now. Will I remember that? I don't know. I've known it before, and I've forgotten it before. The original Furby and Armatron toys had only one motor. Is that true? That's pretty wild. I know Furbies could talk and blink separately at the very least. Do I still use my electric skateboard? Yes. I use it often. I actually don't have a car right now, so I'm using it plenty. Um, yeah, the Bust and Yo Face skateboard. Um, it's a blast. Super fun board, and I'm super glad to have it. The battery life has gone down quite a bit. I used to be able to skate to the climbing gym and back on one battery. Now I have to go plug it in at the gym. Another one of my uh, mistakes regarding electronics was running the battery to empty quite a few times, and that quickly decreased the battery life. So now I try to plug it in and charge it whenever I can. Oh, all right. I'm excited to see if this works. 
Um, you definitely see that the metal plate is a little worn down. Um, like foil, foil tape, conductive tape might be the best option if I could just stick that on top. Yay, car money. I'm going to get the nicest $2 car. Thank you, Dino. Yeah, let's hope uh, just cleaning this pad works and that I don't have to, like, put a thin layer of solder on top. Would that work? I feel like that might really cause some problems. <laughs> might work, though. All right. That's the cheese break. Let's get back to it. Nothing too crazy here. Just gonna... Got some 91% ISO. Q-tip. Bada boom. And some cre cheese grease from my fingertips. I hear that's also very good to, to clean things. All right. Tis being cleaned. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, guys. Y'all need to see this. I'm trying to get some high res. National Geographic shots here. It's hard to keep things in focus, you know. Uh, you definitely still see the tracks of where this these pins have been running. So I don't know how much this cleaning will do. But I guess it's the first thing to try. Let's say that's sufficiently clean. Um, where's the lid for this thing? It's crazy how easy stuff gets lost. Oh, the lid, the lid is on top of it. it. Okay. Give that a second or two to dry off. Tighten or loosen the screws a bit. It could change the distance. I mean, the pins are on springs, so I don't think that should cause a problem. It would be nice if I could actually just, like, shift everything a tiny bit. That way the pins aren't running on the same area that they used to. It would get, like, fresh metal to run on. Uh... That'd be a bit tricky, though. Let's just do this for now and see what happens. As much as I like to keep things moving quickly on a live stream, I feel like the wise thing to do here is to just test this out now. So that means we gotta take the batteries out again. Although we don't have to reassemble it completely, we just gotta get this piece back on. Actually, I could just... I guess I could just press it by hand, but no, let's let's install this. It's not so hard. Uh oh. Okay. I almost thought it was symmetrical and then I'd install it backwards, but no. And it's hard to shoot black things and white things in the same scene. <laughs> Alright. They're still a bit magnetized, that's nice. If I do manage to get this functioning... Hold up a sec. There seems to be some... Uh... Oh, this is interesting. Looky here. 
Looky here now. Seems to be some uh, solder. Just a blob of solder on the back here. I'm guessing that was an accident and I should remove it. Unless it was put there on purpose to like move the battery. That definitely looks like someone was just a little sloppy with their solder. There we go. Broke it off. What if that was the whole thing? I doubt it, but. Definitely looked unintentional. I'll recycle my uh, alcohol q tip there. Oh, and there is actually a bit of uh, battery acid on one of these contacts here. Pretty standard with old toys, so I'll get that while we're at it. In general, the condition of this thing looks really good, so that's reassuring. All right, we still have one more screw to put in here. Hey, Henry, thanks for stopping by. It's always awesome to hear about my involvement in people's 3D printing journey. All right. The thingy thing is installed. Hopefully, oh man, it might have been like you got to install it after you've put the rest of it together. The order of these things fitting together, you know, might matter. But for now, we don't have to assemble the base completely. We just want to see if this was the problem. Oh, clean the pins also. I guess that's not a bad idea. They look super clean, but... Honestly, the pad didn't look too terrible itself, so... A little bit of cleaning on the pins. We can actually look at the board while we're at it, see if anything is blown up. Guess it'll be hard for me to show it to y'all. <laughs> Focus is annoying, huh? Um, a quick inspection doesn't show me any super obvious damage anywhere. The pins are all still springy. Um, yeah, I think it's good. So let's go ahead and uh, how does this go together again? Like so. So I could just manually hold it. Ah, but I don't know. I think that would kind of go against the point of making sure that the springs are making contact. Or maybe, ah, I mean, I want to know if the springs are the problem in the first place, but let's see. Let's see how easy this comes together without the speakers and everything, but just so that it can rotate itself. I believe it goes together something like this. There we go. That was not so hard. All right, moment of truth. Let's see what happens. Ooh. It's a bit chunky. <laughs> oh.
I mean, stop for a second. I mean, I'm having trouble keeping it in place, like, aligned with the pins. But who knows if it's even touching correctly. In the meantime, I'm trying to take a look at this. Get a load of this mechanics in here. <laughs> See, he stops. He stops for a second. The other option is that there's a button stuck somewhere, so it constantly thinks it's being touched, but then I should be able to switch into music mode and it should uh, stop. Hmm, what do y'all think? Should I fully assemble it to see if it's, if anything's changed? Or, should we open up the top of this thing? <laughs> okay, I'm actually seeing that there's, the pins are not even close to being in contact. <laughs> I didn't really get it in there enough. kind of uh, tough to do. I thought it, it seemed like it was in there, but it definitely isn't. Oh. There we go. That's in place. It does look like the, uh, I am meant to install this, whatever the thing is, this switch of sorts. It's half of the switch, right? I'm supposed to install that after putting it together. That way it's pressing straight up into the pins rather than trying to, like, knock them over and potentially break one of those pins. So we're going to do that real quick. In the meantime... Hmm. How do we want to be? Something like that? In the meantime... If you have any questions for me, this is a good time. Any questions or suggestions? Anything you've been wanting to see from me? in general, or like uh, taking one of my projects further. It would be cool to know. Get a pulse on my viewers. And I'm gonna try to speed run this and get it assembled real quick. I really wish I had the AC adapter right now. I do have, I might, I do have a few 12 volt transformers and I think I might have one from an old 3D pen. Which 3D pens did I have that were 12 volts? The scribbler, but those had a different size connector. Huh, yeah, I don't think I have the proper adapter right now. That would have been real nice. So I don't have to do this battery deal every time. Anyways. 
I'm going to slide this back in. Also, I just want to know what else y'all are doing. What are you, what, what are my viewers up to? Am I, am I catching you during homework time? Huh. This just doesn't want to slide in all the way. It's almost like the, uh, oh, I see. Got some things that need to be aligned. <laughs> All right, that's as it should be. I really admire people who can uh, run a live stream and keep talking, keep an eye on the chat. It's a lot of work. Woo wee! All right, all right, it's coming together. I will even plug in the speaker and the buttons for now. And sure enough, I have to reference the photo I took to make sure I'm getting two of the plugs in the right order. So, again, always take photos of your wiring. So it's gray, then purple, then green. Gray, then purple, then green. Where are my tweezers? Right here. Boy with skills, are you a fan of the practical prints? Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's pretty common. A lot of people are in it for the functional prints. And there seem to be less of those, just going across, like, 3D printing platforms. There's a lot of decorative files out there already, right? So maybe I do provide the most value with functional things. The problem can be that a lot of functional prints are also pretty niche. Like, oh, I made a connector for these two random products that most of you don't have. Which I think can still make cool content, but uh, especially now I'm trying to move a little bit more into files versus just making content on YouTube. Uh, yeah, ad revenue on YouTube isn't what it used to be, and my viewership has also just gone down. You know, I'm old, I'm losing relevance. But, <laughs> so yeah, that's why I opened up my things. Memberships, so y'all could get access to all my premium files. If you missed that in the last video, definitely become a member if you've been wanting to... Uh, 3D print some make anything files. Oh, there's some foam tape here that I don't know where it belongs. E. Just gonna stick it near where it was. <laughs> Alrighty. See, for me, this is already a victory. Just getting it back together. Let's put in two of the screws here, at least. Man, if this works, I'll be surprised. <laughs> but quite happy. And if it doesn't work, oops. I don't know. Let me get a pulse here from y'all. There's only a few of us here, so we can uh, kind of adjust the stream to what y'all want. Got, what, 30 people on here? It's a nice little crowd. It's like I'm in, a, in front of a little classroom. Um, if y'all want me to do some CAD work instead, I do have another little CAD project. Speaking of functional prints, I do have a functional project I need to work on that will be something that most of you won't need, but maybe it's just nice to follow along in Fusion 360. Um, basically, I need to make a tripod plate, a mount for a tripod. So, fairly simple functional part. It integrates a bolt, so there's some like working within, working with real parts and 3D printed parts and combining them. So I could switch to that, 
Or I could keep trying to get this thing working. Or if we're really lucky, this will just work right now and we'll have it both ways. But I do feel like this project right here is gonna have diminishing returns. More opening it and closing it again over and over again. I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with it. So, might be something I have to do on my own time, huh? Charles, Charlie, you'd like to see some functional CAD work? All right, that's one vote. Phantom Smithy, welcome to the live stream. You did catch us indeed. I'm going to clean this a little bit more again. I keep getting my cheese grease on it now. All right. What, you had one of these? All right, that's a first, because uh, when I introduced it at the beginning of the live stream, everyone was so confused. And one of the first things I mentioned was the weird feel of the, the plastic. It's a little bit sticky, indeed. <laughs> so uh, did yours happen to start acting out, or uh, what happened to it? Because that's what's going on here, which I think we'll see in a second. Unless I happen to fix it. Phantom, uh, we might end this, but I think it's early enough that we could jump into another quick CAD project, which might be what we do. <laughs> yeah, it's super loud. Uh, I did not expect that. I didn't know any noise would be coming from it. Cool. <laughs> Let's throw the batteries in. Your kid immediately broke it. Thought it's made to withstand that kind of stuff. Yeah, Lucy's, I'd also like to know what this cost 10 years ago. Now it seems to be a bit of a collector's item, but it's also seems pretty like fancy there's a lot going on so i can imagine it being expensive back in the day too all right it's closed up again all all i really did was clean one little pad so if that fixes it it's a birthday blessing. If not, it's no big surprise. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I mean, what? It's not turning. Maybe the problem is just that it can't turn. But it was turning before, right? So I, I broke something. <laughs> Oh, that makes me curious. It's, it's doing something differently. Huh. Maybe it's that piece of foam tape that I found in there. Maybe I should have taken it out. Might be binding with the gear now. Why can't it turn? Ah, ah. All right, let me open it up. <laughs> I can't just stop there. Curiosity is killing me. If I destroyed it, I want to know now. Yeah. 
this little sad squisher, squisheroo. Yeah, plastic gears. So uh, hopefully I didn't just strip something. Hey Karen, welcome for welcome for joining us. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the stream. Uh, I've been trying to fix this old robot. A little dancing robot sensation that I've wanted for a long time. And now I have one that doesn't dance. So sad. But looks like we're about to jump into a different project. Unless I make some sort of break breakthrough or progress in the next few minutes. <laughs> yeah, now we're going to print a gear. Although I don't think I have... I don't really have a printer that's ideal for printing nylon right now. And that's kind of what you want for gears, I think. Um... All right, I'm going to throw the batteries back in and see what happens here. With it halfway open. What I should have done from the beginning. Ooh, ooh. It does bow, it does, it does something. I'm glad it's moving, I'm glad it's not like totally busted. All right, let's turn it on like this and see what happens. Shoot. Yeah, it's trying to, trying to turn, but it's not working now. Manually turn it and see if that does anything. Gears are still working at least. I'm just trying to close the contact on the See that? It stopped for a second. <laughs> I feel like it's chilling out. I feel like it, it made the contact it was supposed to there for a second. Am I crazy? I think I, I think it was, <laughs> I think it behaved a bit differently for a second there. I think I lined it up, the pins, how they were meant to be. Ah, I can tell we're close to a solution, but also it is going to take time just opening and closing. So I think we're going to go and uh, do some, some CAD to switch things up for the stream. Just. I mean, the solution here seems within reach, though. I, I'm still optimistic. I don't know what's in the way now from it turning. But it'll get there. It'll get there.
Alright. So, let's not dilly dally. We're gonna go ahead and jump straight into and jump straight into another project, which is this tripod plate. So this is a very fancy, very expensive carbon fiber tripod. I may have shared this story before on another live stream, but it's one of my biggest, uh, I don't know, some kind of win. I happened to be on Amazon when the clock struck midnight for Prime Day and there was a glitch on the website. And these tripods were like 90% off when they should have been 15% off. And uh, usually I'm not for screwing anyone over, but I think Jeff Bezos could handle the hit, so I don't know. I bought them and was like thinking there's a 10% chance they actually show up, and they did. So anyways, I've got a bunch of tripods. I've got two of these, and each one came with one of these locking plates. But I have three things that I want to lock up. I've got my video camera, my photo camera, and now I have a teleprompter. And I also use this tripod to hold up my teleprompter. Um, and as nice and heavy duty as these steel plates are, I think it's a bit overkill for something like my teleprompter, which isn't so heavy. So I figured I could just 3D print a third plate instead of spending like $150 on one. It's Manfrotto. Everything costs insane insane amount. Uh, in a previous Cool Prints video, I already replaced like a knob that was missing on one of them. I'm going to print all the replacements because, because we can make anything. That's what it's all about. So anyways, I figured this would be a fun little project. Basically, the way this plate works, it's got this standard quarter 20 mount. It slides, but uh, we're actually going to simplify some things probably because we don't need it to slide. It's just going to connect to a teleprompter. Uh, on the bottom here, there's this mechanism for uh, the quick release. So you can slide it in and it'll lock into place on the tripod and then you press a button to release it. Basically, these little uh, ledges catch onto a pin and when you press it, it lets it slide through. Pretty simple stuff. <laughs> Is it already on printables? Say it ain't so. Doesn't matter, because I'm going to do this one specifically how I need it. <laughs> For one thing, again, since this is pretty much going to be permanently attached onto uh, the teleprompter, now that I'm thinking about it, I could have done two screws, but I only prepared one. But like, uh, there's this rubber grip here. I considered printing it in TPU. But I think I'm just going to use some double-sided foam tape so I can really just stick it on there and have it stay there. As for the bolt part, we're not going to print that. That would be a bit too weak. So I already prepared this with a quarter 20 standard bolt. I actually had to cut it short using my Dremel since I didn't have one like this any longer and it would bottom out on the bottom of my camera. This was originally for my camera, but I decided to use it for my teleprompter. Anyways, let's take a look at that thing. Here's my teleprompter. Well, that's a cool angle. Um, it's probably among the cheaper ones that I could buy, but it works totally fine. There are some other mods I want to do, like uh, this adjusting thing, the screw tightens, but it still wiggles a bit. So I'll probably uh, print some supports for that stuff at some point. But for now, we're just gonna have our base plate that screws into here. And like I just realized, I probably could just have two screws. That would be a super secure connection. But that would also mean I have to make another one of these. And I don't think it's really necessary. I'm gonna screw this in, make it real nice and tight. It's gonna have double stick foam tape. That ain't going anywhere. So, let's get to CAD. Of 
course, as always, one of my goals is going to be to make this uh, no support object. I was going to say print in place, but that's actually not very important to me. I uh, care a lot more about something just being support free. Because I don't like waste. Things can be non-print in place. They can be printed in multiple parts. And that doesn't mean they're wasteful. Maybe it's an unpopular opinion, but I think print in place is a little bit overrated. It's one of the top search terms on things. And I get it, it's cool. You can print things that you couldn't do without a 3D printer. But also, sometimes it's cool to print things just in the way that makes them the best, that's the most efficient with material. And multiple parts means you can print things in multiple colors and make them really fun that way too. John, can I put on side rails to constrain the rotation? That is another option that would be good. But uh, I think in my print in place, or in my, uh, because I want it to be without supports, I'm actually going to have it print upside down like this. So I'm going to keep this whole bottom completely flat. Otherwise, rails on the side would actually be a pretty nifty solution. I, I don't really have anything against that. I'm sure it could be made to print this way. This would also be able to print without supports, but there's a lot of bridging. Well, it would need a little bit of work anyways, but... <laughs> Do I actually use the space mouse? Yeah, you can see the space mouse here. I get a lot of questions about it. People begging for videos. And uh, if I'm being honest, I don't use it too often. I use it mostly for viewing the models and for demonstrating things on video and on live stream because it makes it look very smooth when I'm turning around an object. So anytime I show some CAD work as a screenshot on my videos, I'm usually using the space mouse. In terms of modeling, do I have one hand on here at all times? Am I using the shortcut buttons? I'm not. <laughs> I admit. That's why I haven't made a video yet. I'm always like, I should get like super comfortable with this thing, but uh, I haven't had the need yet. If I had an extra hand. No, I, there are some times where I find myself moving my hands a lot to get between shortcuts and typing in a number or something, and then I'm like, oh, it probably would be more efficient to learn the space mouse. But yeah, it's not that I am not a fan, it's just I haven't been motivated to use it a whole lot. All right, so let's start making this thing here in CAD. Uh, we're in Fusion 360. I don't know how familiar y'all are. I have a feeling I've got a lot of uh, experienced CADers in the crowd, but uh, I'll try to make this as uh, accessible as possible. So basically, we're going to start with my favorite tool, the, dig the digital calipers. And I'm going to just go ahead and start measuring this out to get a, a profile here. This is what we're going to start with, the profile. And uh, so this is 10.15 millimeters tall. Let's go ahead and start a new sketch here from the front. I'm going to create a center line. And then I'll just start drawing out half of this shape, kind of this angled block. It does have a little bit of a straight section on top, like that, mirrored. Thanks for the super chat, boy, with skills. You want more, more cheese sticks? Now, now. Don't get greedy. Um, Alright. So that little ledge is going to make it a little more difficult. I don't have like a, an angle measuring tool, so we're just going to have to go out with the calipers. And there's also some little tiny radiuses. Um, but let's go ahead and see what this looks like. Actually, 
brain blast. We might be better off measuring the tripod itself, where the parts are actually fitting in. Because here, we're measuring tangent to the radius, and if we don't know exactly what that radius is, we might lose some accuracy. Um, Again, with this part, accuracy isn't super critical. We don't need like multi, what is it? micro millimeter precision or anything um, because the tripod actually has a, a screw that you can tighten. So as long as it's within the range of being able to tighten on it, this should work. Um, but anyways, let me, let me do it the way I would do it. Sometimes on live stream, I try to take shortcuts just for the sake of not having to move the camera around or grab something from the garage. But in this case, I do really think it makes sense to measure here instead. And I'm getting 56.4 in there. 56.4 in there. And uh, measuring the actual plate I'm getting like 55.9 with the radius. So I think 56.4 could, we could just make that the true width here. Because we're going to put a radius on it. 56.4 and we'll divide that by 2 because we are just sketching out half of it. Anytime you are sketching a mirrored object, it makes sense to just do half of it. Anyways, sorry, I realize it's dark. <laughs> We're going to measure that top ledge now. 48.1. So between here and the center line, 48.1 divided by 2 again. And uh, let's just measure the height of that little ledge. Looks to be two millimeters even. And then we can measure the height of the entire metal piece. And that is a little bit over 10, 10.1. Maybe I should make it 10. I'm going to make it 10. <laughs> I think it's okay to have a little more wiggle room. That'd be a lot better than having it not fit in here at all. Yeah, Ray, I am really impressed with what some people do in Tinkercad alone. I'm sure something like this could be done in Tinkercad, but uh, thankfully, Autodesk has, at least up to now, still maintained a, a free hobbyist version of Fusion 360 for people who want to do stuff like this. I'm on an educational license, thanks to videos like this. Oh, but of course, I forget to <laughs> move the screen on my live stream. Here, I'll use the space mouse. Oh, it's a bit chunky while I'm recording at the same time. So yeah, sorry, I didn't have this on screen, but basically, top dimension, I did 48.1 divided by 2. And I got the height of this little lip, the height of the entire thing. And we also got the width of this bottom. Why is it showing crazy numbers? Ah, here, 56.4 divided by 2. So, four measurements, that devi defines this whole thing. Um... I guess we can also sketch in this cutout. There are these uh, locking parts that we're going to have to add, but we'll add that from another sketch. For now, we'll just measure. Got to jump it between cameras. <laughs> For now, I'm just going to measure the width of this thing. So it looks to be 43 and a half. And it's actually a little more narrow in here. 41, 41 and a half. So that's annoying. I was hoping it was the same. 
and I'm trying to figure out why. I guess it's just so it locks in a bit easier. Okay. While I could inc include that in this first sketch, we're just going to do it all in a new sketch, because that kind of makes more sense to me. Uh, if you spend time in Fusion, you'll learn that there are many ways to do the same thing. So for now, yep, I'm going to have this all selected, and we're going to create a mirror. Mirror it across the center line. And we can also select the center line and hit X to make it a construction line. Just makes it a little bit easier going forward. So now we can just select this and hit extrude. Let's shrink me down a bit. My face ain't that important. So we're going to extrude this whole profile. And um, another good practice is to keep the model centered over the origin. So while I could just extrude in one direction, good practice says do a symmetrical extrusion and define the whole length that way. So now I'll use my calipers once again and measure the height of this entire plate, which could be shorter actually for this print, but I guess it does lend some strength to the part, having it be this long. So it's 139.75 millimeters. 139.75. Bada boom! We now have a 3D object. There we go, there's the Space Mouse in action. It is definitely nice and smooth. It just feels nice to use it. Alright, we've got that. Um... Before we start doing little radiuses and details, we'll do a sketch on the bottom. And that's how we can get pretty much all the rest of this information in on it. Yes. So I'm going to hit P and select this face to project it just so that we can reference all the existing edges or just these bottom edges that we need to reference. Although we're not going to reference the outer edge because this actual object has a radius. It's narrower than this object in our CAD file is at this moment. So I'm going to measure everything outward from the center. That won't be affected by my uh, inaccurate measurement right now. So anyways, <laughs> Gotta jump back again just to show you what I'm measuring. I already did measure this, but I forgot. Call me human. Alright. So 43.5. Well, the first thing I'll do is create a center line again. It's another symmetrical sketch. And then I'll kind of just eyeball what it's looking like at first. Something like that. And it's actually symmetrical in two directions. So we can uh, draw just a quarter of our shape to start out. And again, just to make sure, I'm going to measure things many, many times. 43. Uh, and I'm on the wrong screen again. Sorry. So I did a center line here, and then I did a center line here. Because this shape is the same on the opposite side, and it's also the same on the top and the bottom. So, uh, again, it's good practice just to sketch as little as necessary. VRCAD. I tried a bit of VRCAD many, many years ago. Still needed work, of course, but who knows with this new Apple VR AR headset that costs a billion dollars, uh, we might be approaching a usable state for VR. It's already been really fun for like uh, 3D modeling, more freeform stuff. I miss doing that. Anyways, 43.75 is what I'm going to go with. 43.75 divided by 2, since we're only doing half of it once again. And uh, whenever you're measuring things like this, 
if you're going to round things, which I often do, just for my own brain, uh, it's good to consider the use. Like, it, if you round it down, will that screw with it? If you round it up a bit, will that mess with it? In this case, it's better that this gap is larger than smaller, so that it doesn't interfere with the little tab that it pushes out of the way to lock into the tripod. Anyways, I do want to jump back and forth. So we measured that section. Now we can measure these little ramps, even though they're not critical. Might as well do it accurate to the original design. So that's 18.3 for the entire thing. And I'm just going to keep jumping back and forth. <laughs> That's the best way to make sure I don't get my brain mixed up. We can measure that. Then we can measure this little flat section here. Seems to be about five millimeters. Again, there's a lot of non-critical dimensions on this one, which is why this is a nice project right now. And then finally, uh, we just need the depth from the ramp to the edge here. And I'll do that with the bottom of the caliper here. And that, oops, giving us four millimeters. Four millimeters is the height of this thing. Oops. All right, and now as I noticed earlier, this is not collinear with this line, so we're gonna have to measure that separately. I'll do this off camera for the sake of moving things along. It's 41.88.9, let's go with that. 41.9 divided by two. Ah. We still have to measure this little section as well. You want to get rid of all those undefined measurements. So that's about 9.4, right here. 9.4, and you'll notice as soon as I do that, all the lines are black. That means we have a fully defined sketch, which means that if we adjust one measurement, it shouldn't cause chaos across the entire sketch. You know, parametric design is beautiful because you can uh, modify individual measurements without destroying the entire model in theory. Anyways, I've selected this whole thing now. And uh, let's do a mirror across this line. And then we can select both of those. And I'm using shortcuts. Sorry, I just realized I don't have uh, the thing that pops up and shows you the keys I'm using. But you can always go up here, and you can see my shortcut here. And you can click these triple buttons and create your own shortcut. I'm pretty sure this is one that I made myself, Shift-M. And then we'll select this other line. And look at that. We've created that whole sketch by just drawing one quarter of it. Saves us some measurements. All right. While we're at it, from this view, you can also uh, measure, uh, we can model in this slot. And this is one part that I'm going to do more simply. We don't need it to be uh, sliding like it is on this actual part. And it'll actually print a little easier, maybe a little more sturdy, if we just make that a single point, which is all we need for the teleprompter. So let me grab that again. Teleprompter. So normally this moves so that you can adjust this depending on the center of the weight. So I'm just going to kind of estimate where we want it to be based on there's going to be a camera on the back here and a tablet on the front. I'm pretty sure the screw being near the bottom position here is going to work best to connect with that hole. I'm going to go with that. Again, this contraption 
Well, now that I think about it, I forgot that the camera is also mounted onto the teleprompter. So it's actually using more weight than uh, the tripod normally holds. But the teleprompter is also just standing in one place. So I'm never going to be swinging it around. I could be making this plate for my uh, photo camera DSLR instead. That's actually probably lighter. Lighter, but maybe thrown around a bit more. Anyways, for now I'm going to do it like this. If I need to print more in the future, maybe I will. <laughs> um, yeah, but again, I have my own little screw here that I made. And I have a few different washers, but we're going to go with the wide one. Because washers are basically uh, spreading out the force of the screw. So a larger washer is going to be less likely to break or deform the 3D print. And uh, we're going to want to take account for the size of this washer here. Yeah, hold on. Let me try to explain this. <laughs> so, for this plate to slide onto here, the hardware needs to fit inside of that gap. So, my version... would not fit if I modeled this exactly the same. So I'm actually going to have to uh, take the, I'm going to measure the depth of this and make sure it fits within this plate, basically. I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, follow along here and I think it will. So. So as I said, the bolt being all the way down here is working for me, I believe. So I'm just going to measure where that is from one end. Looks like it's almost exactly 50 millimeters. So we can create our circle with the center being 50 millimeters from one side, like that. And now we're going to be measuring things based on the bolt I'll be using here. So uh, the hole needs to be at least 6.1 millimeters wide. I'm going to make it 6.8 so that the threads don't get caught on it. It's just so that it works nice and smoothly. 6.8. And then we're also going to make sure there's space for the entire washer. That's going to be a separate hole. It's 18.7. So let's make that 19, using the same center point, 19 millimeters. Okay? From there, this is pretty awesome. It's going to be easy to make it print in place because all, uh, all this complicated stuff is happening on one surface. So for this part, we're actually going to still go off of the measurements from this actual plate. 6.1 is the thickness from the bottom. So I can go make the extent to object, select this face, and then offset it minus 6. 6, what did I say it was? Yeah, actually it is pretty much exactly 6. 6.1, ah! Uh, Alright, let's make it 6.1. <laughs> Alright, there we go. Because this is the measurement we took. It's already getting a lot of the way there. Yeah, I could, uh, I could melt the bolt head in or something. Um, but in this case, that's just unnecessary. I'm just going to screw it in nice and tight, and it'll, it'll stay. If I wanted to be extra secure, I could use a locking washer. But I don't think that's going to happen. I could even glue it if I really wanted to, but I think I'm just going to try to tighten it nice and tight. And then I'll always keep an eye on it. If it starts to come loose, then I'll, I'll deal with it at that point. Billy Rubin, welcome. So good to see ya. It's been a while since we've chatted.
Mm. Yeah, 3D scanning. A lot of people ask about that. I love 3D scanning for making cases for devices and stuff. You've seen me use it in my Cool Prints videos when I made uh, cases for my 360 camera. I've used it for making accessories for like something like this would be so hard to measure with the calipers and get an accurate reference. Something like this on the other hand, I think I'm actually better off uh, designing it in scratch just like this. Anyways, let's see, where were we? Let's go back and turn on that sketch because we're going to use it again. And we're going to start by extruding this whole thing. Like I said, we're, we're designing it based exactly on the hardware I have here. And we know that from the top of that part, we need it to clear. So this thing is 5.7 millimeters. We'll make it 5.8 just to be sure. But that's referencing from up here. From up here, we know it has to go down 5.8. So I'm going to use that surface as the starting point of this extrusion. And then the distance will be 5.8. Or I guess minus 5.8. There we go. And as you can see, it just cuts a little bit further into our printed part here. And then last of all, we've got this hole that goes all the way through. And uh, what I should have done, again, for good practice, <laughs> I could have made both of these center lines construction lines. And then when you're going here and doing extrusions, you can just select it all at once instead of selecting the two halves like I just did. There's a million ways to do stuff in Fusion. Anyways, now we have a plate that should slide into my tripod. It should fit this bolt. We're like almost done. We're almost done. It's just a matter of a little bit of finessing now. Uh, like I said at the beginning, we do have some radii on the edges here. And while I did measure this based on the uh, part that it's sliding into, it should already work, but I'm just going to give it a little tiny fillet half a millimeter. And that's purely eyeballing it. Sometimes that works. Sometimes there's no use doing more than that. <laughs> uh, the actual part also has a, a small fillet here. I mean, a machined part like this is basically going to have a radius on every single edge. Uh, with 3D printing, we don't need to do that. And in fact, one of the biggest peeves I have on uh, designs you find on Thingiverse is if there's a radius on a bottom angle like this that's meant to be against the print surface. That's, ah. Anyways, if you do want that rounded, you're better off using a chamfer. So for the sake of it, just, just for fun, let's do it. 0.4, not meters, 0.4 millimeters chamfer. Uh, let's make it 0.3. So you could do a chamfer and then a fillet on the top edge. Make that 0.6, for example. Well, I've lost my ability to type. There we go. That way you can still have a fillet, but the angle doesn't become steeper than 45 degrees, which might cause problems when you're trying to print it. Even this is a little more challenging to print, technically. The fact that you have a sharp corner leading to a 45 degree overhang. Depending on the material and the printer, it might want to curl up on those edges a bit. So we could actually put fillets on these edges. As great as one millimeter. And as you can see from the bottom, that'll round this bit. And that'll make it print a little more cleanly. So even though the actual machined part doesn't have a one millimeter, well, it kind of does. I don't know if you can see that, but it, it might be a millimeter fillet. Anyways, sometimes you got to change the part for the sake of printing.
So whether or not that's how it is, that's how it's going to be. Um, let's see, do we want to extend that elsewhere? We could do little chamfers or fillets on these edges. It might add a bit of strength, but at this point, I think this would print really nice and clean, and I think it'll work. I think it'll do what it needs to do. Like I said, I'm not going to bother uh, making a TPU parts for this, since I'm just going to use foam tape and have it permanently stuck to the bottom of my camera. But if I do release these files for people to print, then I might make a variation that has all the bells and whistles as well. Whenever I'm printing uh, something for the public use, that's when you really want to do it as well as you can do it, because you're spending an extra hour or two in the CAD, but you gotta, gotta imagine optimistically that a thousand people might find use in this model. And you want to make it as easy for them as possible. You want as many successful prints as possible. Because every failed print multiplied by a thousand, that's a lot of wasted material. So, uh, you know. I could even put helper discs on the feet here. But nowadays that's built into slicers. And I think this is a fairly simple model to print. I don't think I'm going to have any trouble. Even though I'll probably print it with CPE or PETG. A little trickier to get it to stick down. Uh, this is a large surface that might want to warp, so I'll probably print this with a brim. And you know what? I am going to give these some tiny little 0.5 millimeter fillets everywhere. I think it will help a bit. But that's pretty much all there is to it. So um, let me know if you all have any questions in the chat. Unfortunately, I don't have a printer in this room at the moment. I can't, can't get it started until after the stream. But I guess I'll update in the Discord channel. There should already be a link to my Discord channel in the description for this video. So uh, if you want updates on this and most future projects, that's generally where I like to drop any advanced updates or anything. I don't know. We'll fill out these two. Why not? And uh, let's also put a chamfer on this. Whenever something's printing against the bottom surface, you know, there's a chance that there's going to be some elephant foot. The first layer of your print might squish out a bit. So I like to put a... 0.4 to 0.6 millimeter chamfer on edges like that, that might matter. See that one, if it's squished, then the bolt might not fit through anymore. Totally not a big deal, but it's easy enough to make sure that doesn't happen right now. So I'm going to do that. This edge doesn't have a chamfer, but it's also entirely non-critical to the function of this part. So we're going to leave that as B. What up, Diego? My cousin, Diego, uh, he makes the uh, very awesome beat that I use for my Cool Prince videos. Chef Goyardee, check it out if you need music. Um, when will I work for NASA? I don't know. You know, once they start printing a lot of things in space, that's definitely a goal of mine to have something 3D printed in space. That would be awesome. I already met one of my goals when uh, Tim from... Uh, <laughs> oh, why am I blanking? Tim, Tim, he does all the cool toys. Anyways, Tim's Toys, I forget the name of his channel, but he featured some of my designs in the past. That was a goal. Next, I want to have something printed in space. And I also want Adam Savage to print something of mine, now that he's uh, working with 3D printers on Tested. Anyways, this design is good to go, I would say. So, that's all there is to that. Like I said, I'll update y'all in Discord. Maybe I'll post a story about it on Instagram. But between that, 
I'm working on the keypon robot there. I think I'm gonna call it a stream for tonight. The good news is this stream I'd say went pretty much without a hitch. I didn't get cut off halfway through. Uh, I decided to just set a microphone over there instead of wearing a lapel so I don't tangle and trip over it. I'd say this was a successful stream and it makes me more uh, eager to do another one in the future. So uh, thanks for joining. I appreciate the small crowd on this Thursday night. Every single one of you, whether you popped in for five minutes or you've been here the whole time. Much appreciated. I can't wait to see you all soon and keep sharing my fun projects. That's it. That's it for today. All right. Take care. Stay inspired. Love you all. Peace.